Aaron, he's asking, Aaron, can you make a video of this topic outlining the key points made here? I hear names. I visualize nothing to be able to agree or truly understand. I absolutely Bones, will. Et cetera, I have, like your evolution in series. Yeah, I, I absolutely will make a video on these things. Uh, there was a guy named David Menton who, as far as I can tell, is a medical doctor who was paid by a certain pseudoscience propaganda mill to pose as a scientist and use his alleged expertise in anatomy to, to try to counter the scientific consensus that birds are, in fact, a subset of dinosaurs. Well, he says they're not because, of course, his, uh, his, his religious convictions require that he deny reality. Are birds really dinosaurs? You've probably heard that they are. Everybody is saying that uh, birds aren't extinct. They're feeding on our bird feeders even as we speak. Is that really true? I think we need to put our critical caps on and uh, look into whether is it true that birds really are dinosaurs as so many claim them to be. For me, the answer is pretty clear and it's pretty simple. No. <laughs> I don't think they are. I could open for questions right now, but I suspect you wanted a little bit more than that. What's so special about birds? Why are they so different, not only from dinosaurs, but everything else that isn't a bird? Here's a short list. What's unique about birds? Tremendous amount of bone fusion. If you look at the skeleton of all vertebrates, there's a great deal of bone fusion. We have many more bones in our body when we were in the womb than we do out of the womb, because many of those bones that were separate in the womb are together. So our human body has about 206, 207 bones, depending on a certain state of fusion. Uh, birds have so many uh, fused bones that a chicken ends up with about 120 fused bones, uh, almost something like half of what we would have. Uh, so bone fusion is big. We'll talk about it. Uh, you've heard that birds have hollow bones. A better word is pneumatic bones. That means air flows through the bones, part of the respiratory system. Now, a lot of us have hollow bones. We human beings have uh, pneumatic bones. Our sinus bones, uh, the frontal sinuses, maxillary sinuses, ethmoid sinus, these are hollow, communicate with the respiratory system, but oh, nothing like birds. Here, uh, all of the bones in the body of the bird, almost all are, are pneumatic. Uh, the way that a bird balances on two legs. As you know, birds walk on two legs, and the sort of dinosaurs that are believed to have evolved into birds and uh, also walked on two legs. They're called the theropods. Word basically means beast foot. And uh, if you're gonna walk on two legs, you have a real problem, and that problem is balance. Did you ever try eating at a two-leg table? Boy, that's a handful. You got one hand holding the table up and the other hand you're eating with. The difference between a four-leg table, which is very stable, no matter how you put the weight on it, and a two-leg table is huge. So when a creature walks on two legs, balance is an issue. And the way birds balance on two legs is completely different than the way dinosaurs do. We'll get to that too. Uh, how they balance also impacts on the way a bird walks. No creature walks quite like a bird. Uh, you can try it, but it won't work out for you. And then the whole anatomy of the shoulder girdle, the shoulder blade, the way the arms that are wings in the case of a bird, the way they attach is completely different. And then the hip bones are extraordinarily different in a bird. We'll take a look at those. And the way a bird breathes, uh, nothing has lungs like a bird. You realize birds have been hit by aircraft at an altitude of 37,000 feet? Well, I'll tell you, if you're up at, I've been up 14,260 feet on a mountain without any oxygen support, and that was hard to breathe there, but 37,000 feet, and think of it, birds have high metabolic rates, high body core temperatures, expending a lot of energy, trying to keep flying with such thin air, and birds are able to do it. I got a feeling if you put up a T-Rex at 37,000 feet to tell him to puff away, he wouldn't make it. Uh, I believe birds are the only, uh, kinds of creatures that have feathers. Now, a lot of people disagree with, agree with me. They say dinosaurs had feathers. We'll look at a, an example or two of that. 
And finally, the way a bird flies. There are a lot of different creatures that are very different that fly. They're flying insects and flying mammals like bats, but birds have their own way of flying. So to counter his allegations, I got a hold of an actual scientist who specializes in paraves. I hope I'm saying that right. It might be paraves or paraves. Uh, this is Dar Dr. Darren Nash, who is uh, a, an expert in that area. And so uh, he's also the host of the, the Tetsu um, or Tetrapod Zoology, uh, the book, the podcast, and the annual science conference in London, uh, which I attended once upon a time. If I lived in London, I would see I would go to this event every year. Uh, Dr. Nash, how are you doing, sir? I'm very good, thank you. And how are you, Orrin? It's good to see you again. So uh, it was a little bit painful to watch uh, David Menton's uh, hour-long presentation. What did you think of it? Um, I thought it was interesting that he gave a uh, pretty good review of many of the kind of key points that creationists like to touch on. Um, it was a pretty good over overview for, for beginners of, of um, you know, everything about anatomy, what it is that makes birds special. And, you know, the creationist perspective is obviously saying that birds are so special, there's no way they can, certainly there's no way they can be dinosaurs and there's no way they can even have evolved. Uh, that's, that's obviously the take they're trying to push. But you don't have to be an expert or know very much about birds and dinosaurs to start to see some pretty obvious gaping holes in the logic. Well, let's dig in then, and I think I can emphasize how unusual birds are by asking a question that should be obvious. The answer should be obvious. And yet this question has plagued people down through the generations. And that question is this, do penguins have knees? Haven't you thought about that a little bit? I mean, where are the knees on these little rascals? Is this, uh, is this a knee right uh, here? Uh, here or here? Where, where are the knees? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I can tell you this, you've never seen the knee on a living bird. In fact, you've never seen the whole femur. That's everything from the hip to the knee on a living bird. Give you a little test. Here is a ostrich, obviously, and uh, he's a two-legged affair, and he obviously has to balance. He doesn't want to fall over frontwards or backwards and his legs seem to be in just the right position so that there's approximately the same amount of weight forward of the legs where they come out of the body in the back. But where are the knees? You're probably thinking that right about, uh, right about here is the knee, here and here. Well, I got news for you. That's not the knee. It's bent the wrong way, for one thing. That's the ankle. And if that's the ankle, it means everything from here to here is the foot. How would you like to buy Reeboks to fit these things? So I'll show you where the uh, knee actually is uh, on an ostrich. And it's right about there where we're pointing. And the dotted line represents where the femur would be inside the bird's body. There is no dinosaur put together, unless you just declare birds to be dinosaurs, and of course the whole debate collapses. You know, I could call my two arms legs, right? If I call my two arms legs, how many legs would I have? The answer is not four, it's two, just because you call arms legs. doesn't make them legs. Same with birds and dinosaurs. So the femur is about where you see the dotted line, and instead of the bird balancing from the left end of that dotted line at the hip, the way a dinosaur or a human would, walking on two legs, uh, it balances from the knee. And it turns out this is just perfect, because what happens is the balance has been brought from way back at the back of the bird, further forward by flexing those thighs up inside the body. Um, so, so Huxley wrote an, uh, wrote an article uh, where he's analyzing the game hen that was given to him for dinner, and he's exploring how the, the feet and legs of this are exactly like what he sees in the dinosaur fossils, which is the next argument we need to get to, where Minton made the most egregious comments in trying to trying to, to isolate the legs as being uniquely avian. And he said so many stupid things about that. My, 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 my favorite, the, the dumbest thing that he said was that you know, you've never seen the knee 
of a living bird because he said that the thought, when he, he couldn't, he, for whatever reason, this anatomist kept referring to the femur, not as the bone that a femur is, but as the entire thigh. He, and, and later he would say thigh, but for whatever reason, he just, he thought thigh and femur, I guess, were interchangeable words meaning the same thing. But he said that a bird's thighs are entirely inside of its body and that they don't, the bird's legs don't poke out of the body until you get to the drumstick, which is just bizarre. He, he then argued, and we, and if he even used chickens as an example. And I'm, I'm thinking, has he never seen a plucked chicken? He talked about plucked chickens, so he must have seen plucked chickens. He said that they did not have any skin on the inside of uh, inside of their thigh, only on the outside, because the thighs were completely in. I've, I've got pictures, I wish I could show, of plucked chickens showing me you know, the inside skin of the thigh. So I mean, just absolutely wrong about everything. But then he said that ostriches... It was his example at that moment. He said that ostriches balance on their knees, not on their pelvis. And he uh -huh. said that dinosaurs balance on their pelvis. So which, did Velociraptor balance on its pelvis or on its knees? Well, this is, again, this is him trying to say that birds are in a completely different box from dinosaurs. And... Uh, if you unpack this, it's as as we've been saying for the other stuff. It's you're looking at a a, a, a substantial range of variation from the let's say the tyrannosaur-like condition to the modern bird condition. You're seeing all manner of intermediates between those two. So um, now, what ha any any one of the features that you could talk about here? So movement of the femur. Uh, form and breadth and depth of the pelvis, the orientation and such of those pelvic, uh, pubic bones, and the length and robustness of the tail. You know, we've touched on some of these things already. He touched on some of these things also. They're all connected because they're all part of a story whereby, I shouldn't use the word story, they're all part of a model in which we understand that dinosaurs were transitioning from a tail-based uh, hind limb system to a hip based uh, muscle system. So, uh, and, and exactly what was driving this is, is an interesting question that's currently under investigation. It might be something to do with them also uh, enlarging the forelimbs because they're relying on the, you know, the hands and arms in predation more and, you know, evolving big feathers on the forelimbs. It might, that might explain why the tail in dinosaurs is becoming shorter and shallower and less muscular and the main muscle that drives the the pulling back the retraction of the hind limb is called the cordo femoralis longus the cfl i'm sure you're familiar with it um that muscle was reduced and changed its attachment from the side the underside of the tail to the pelvis um in this as, as birds are becoming more bird-like. This, this, this transition happens uh, both at the start of bird history, so you're seeing changes happening, you know, velociraptor-type animals. You're also seeing a lot of these changes happen within birds. Again, a lot of the most profound changes in this entire sequence are those that occur between Archaeopteryx and modern birds, not outside of the bird clade. So an animal like Velociraptor is still using a tail-based retraction system. It does have muscles that are attached to the side of the, the underside of the tail, but they're less important, they're smaller, they're more lightweight, these muscles, than they are in other kinds of predatory dinosaurs like allosaurs and tyrannosaurs. You still would see femoral, you know, movement of the femur in a dinosaur like Velociraptor. You still would in an early bird like Archaeopteryx. And as you get towards modern birds, you see them relying more and more and more on knee-based movement rather than movement at the the hip joint. So uh, it's dishonest to say that um, Archaeopteryx is using Archaeopteryx is using the modern bird system, which is mostly reliant on movement at the knee. Uh, you would actually see movement happening at the the, uh, the the hip joint, and it's and even in modern birds, it's not true. They've as as he he was wrong in in saying that everything is now transitions to uh, a knee based system. Even in modern birds, there is still movement of the femur, and the idea that you can't see the the thigh is 
you know, utterly wrong, even even for living birds. Um, anyone who's ever read about this or looked into it, it's within five minutes you'll find videos of running ostriches. Ostriches have got naked thighs, probably for reasons of you know wanting to get rid of excess heat. And if they hold their wings up out of the way, you can see their thighs um, pumping up and down. You can in you know it's been studied in guinea fowl in particular. They they undergo quite a reasonable amount of thigh movement. If you look at baby birds that don't have all their feathers, you it's not difficult to see their thighs either so again this was just a and they're not inside the body like they're not inside the body. yeah i i, yeah. I had a pet emu uh, which is it was a great thing to to, to walk a, a six foot six inch tall bird down the street just to, to go to the park and everything which we did twice a week uh but i mean i i saw his knees because it's very similar to an ostrich so like you know like you said it's basically naked you get to see the knees and the thighs and it and so where everything he says about the the thigh and the, the femur and the knee all being hidden inside the body is absolute wackaloon nonsense <laughs> i think the only birds it's true for and you saying wackaloon uh reminds me it's true of loons or divers as we call them here in europe and grebes and that's because they have got a very unusual you know hind limb set up because they they're using their gigantic feet as, as as propellers they're the only birds where yeah the whole of the thigh is continuous with the is included in the skin on the outside of the body but yeah and uh, so it walks from the knee on down on its tiptoes ever tried walking from the knee on down on your tiptoes it's difficult what you do is you get high on your tiptoes you just walk on the toes if you're a bird and by the way uh, the dinosaurs that walk on two legs they walk on their toes too in fact your dog works on its toe walks on its toes your cat common uh, so when you're up in your tiptoes, what you do now is you bend down until your chest touches your knee. Boy, that's a tough one to get down there. At that point, your body will be parallel to the ground, and you'll be walking in your toes from the knee on down. You're probably thinking, that's not going to work. Well, it may not work for you, but when the Lord does it, when he outfits an ostrich like this, how well can they walk, walking from their knee on down on, two, on their tiptoes? About 43 miles an hour. That would pretty much smoke any racehorse out there. Well, we clocked the T-Rex to 32 miles an hour. So the way that, that the dinosaurs walk versus the way that birds walk, he, he argued that too. And when you're, I, I, re I realize that when you lose the counterbalance of the tail, as tails get thinner and, and, and have less, uh, less of a counterbalance anyway, and then told they finally just basically disappear you have, and, and you have like a couple of, of, the things he would call birds, which kind of can uh, contradict his own argument, they have very thin tails, and so the, the 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 way that these animals have to move, their femurs still connecting to the pelvis, they are still walking, there's still there's still movement there, uh, in either way. But a tyrannosaur could stand more erect because of the tail counterbalance, and when you lose that counterbalance, it just means that they have to pull the knees up a bit higher to to make up for that loss of weight in the back. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, people have uh, have you seen this study where people put a fake tail on live birds in order to see whether they actually compensated changed their hind limb pose to cope for this great that. Yeah, yeah, and and they and they found that by changing the orientation of the femur um, even modern birds with a super shortened tail and with you know rather different proportions from lots of the non-bird theropods um, can cope with this just by changing uh, femur orientation. So yeah, I mean I, I, overall it, it's like I say dirty tricks to try and make you think that all these animals fit into boxes when they they clearly don't.